all faith to move mountains. What is Paul talking about? Let's stick around and find out. Wednesday, friends. My name is Brandon. Welcome to your midweek boost. This past Sunday at our church, Church Unlimited, we talked about a topic called Remover of Mountains. And as you know, if you've been with us for the past few months, we're on a series called The Gifts of the Spirit. Understanding this, that you are the gift of the Spirit. Your passion, what's in you, as you grow in Christ, it begins to help other people. You are a gift from heaven. Something in you I need and something in me you need. And so together we make up the body of Christ. We came to the end of chapter 12 last week, and I'll just remind you in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31, Paul says, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. And what I reminded you of is that this is not necessarily Paul's invitation to desire the best gifts. He's not encouraging them to desire the best ones. Why would we think that? Because just a few verses later, he said, God's the one that chooses what gift you have, not you. I don't think he'd flip the script and say, now God gave you the gift, but go desire the better ones. In fact, it's just the opposite. We learned in the Greek that there are two options for this, for the mood of earnestly desire. The the one that's typically shown is the imperative mood. It's the mood of command that would say you should covet the greater gifts. What I think Paul is doing instead is the indicative mood. This is a mood of fact. Paul's stating a fact that you guys are all desiring the better gifts, the greater gifts, but let me show you, in contrast, a better way. And that's where we are today. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is the next verse, verse number one. And this is, of course, the love chapter. We'll cover two verses in here this week. In verse number one, 1 Corinthians 13, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I don't have love, I am a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. In other words, no matter how many gifts you may show, no matter how great you think it makes you look, if the motivation behind your behavior, behind your gifting is not love, then it ultimately serves no purpose because it doesn't communicate anything clearly. If I gave you one note, hmm, and I asked you to name that tune, you'd have no idea where I was going. But if I gave you a couple of more, hmm, 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 you might guess happy birthday to you, and you'd be absolutely correct. And I would be an amazing hummer. That's beside the point. So what we understand is that without love, there's no clear communication of who Jesus is as the Christ. And after all these weeks, I hope you're familiar with that's the point of the gifts to communicate Jesus clearly. Verse number two. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, Now, I want to point out quickly that what Paul just did was he pulled in a couple of examples of gifts from a chapter earlier. In chapter 12, we had a list of gifts, not an exhaustive list, but a list of examples of ways that God may work through you to minister to the body of Christ. And he picked out a couple. He picked out prophecy and understanding mysteries and knowledge and even faith. If we get into the original Greek, I think it clarifies where we're headed here. And though I have prophecy, this is the original Greek, and understand all the mysteries. We talked about the mysteries of God. It's God's plan before time began to establish a Savior. And Jesus, of course, is the fulfillment of God's promise of a Savior. That's why he's called the Christ. And this is Paul's point. The gifts point to Jesus as the Christ. He says, and though I have all the knowledge, not just knowledge, all of the knowledge, Jesus is the knowledge of God. He's the wisdom of God. He's the mystery of God. He's the power of God. He's the depths of God. It's always been about Jesus. And that's why we went to the early parts of 1 Corinthians. Because Paul's not just making up some idea to encourage churches to be more spiritual by operating in the gifts. No, the gifts are intended to point the church back to who Jesus is as the fulfillment of God's promise. And then he adds, and though I have all the faith, not just all faith, not just faith that brings items to me, all the faith. If I'm able to comprehend the faith, the new covenant, the conversation of salvation by faith. In other words, Paul is actually being quite hyperbolic here. He's using hyperbole. We'll define that word for you in a moment. Ultimately, we know that hyperbole is an exaggeration. He's exaggerating. He's talking about a super Christian here that gets everything about God 
in this new covenant. But if I don't have love, then I'm nothing. Now, we see these three references to chapter 12, just to prove it out to you. Verse number 8 of chapter 12, 9 and 10. If I have the word of knowledge through the Spirit, uh, faith by the same Spirit, and prophecy by the Spirit. Those are the options, that just some ideas that Paul threw at us. I will point out this, that the same faith that he mentions in chapter 12 is the same faith he mentions in chapter 13. And neither one of them are about you having a supernatural ability to expect miracles to take place, um, events to change for your betterment. That's not what Paul's talking about. He's talking about someone that can communicate the faith of the new covenant. And he says, but without love, it's really irrelevant what I have to say because that is who God is. He is love. And so obviously the gifts of the spirit that point out who, who Jesus is as the Christ, it's all about fulfilling love, loving one another. Now back to verse number two again in the original, though I have prophecy and understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge and have all the faith regarding communicating Jesus as the Christ. So, and then he, note, he adds this on, so that I could remove mountains, but I don't have love, I am nothing. So this faith to remove mountains, let's not confuse that. Let's, let's not miss the point here. If you miss what Paul's saying, then you could find yourself encouraging people to believe God bigger because the mountain can move. And Paul even tells us that you could have a faith to move a mountain. Except that's not what Paul's teaching here. Paul's being hyperbolic. He's exaggerating in order to make a point. Hyperbole is not intended to be taken literally. It's intended to bring your perspective into focus on what's truly important here. And what's important, love, is what he's emphasizing, that the body love one another. Now, something I want you to keep in mind is in the early first century when Paul is writing here, mid-first century, that the Jews and the Hebrews, they had a very common way of communicating and teaching, and that would be by using extreme hyperbole. They would use examples that were far-fetched in order to draw your attention to what they specifically were referencing. So when we get to a point like this, uh, there was the first five books of your Old Testament called the Torah, and then there were also rabbis that taught about the first five books of the Bible and the, the actual communication of these rabbis' conversations. It was called the Talmud. It was just a verbal communication. The Talmud was passed down from generation to generation verbally. It wasn't until 70 AD, the destruction of the, of the temple in Jerusalem, that the Talmud was first written down. And so this phrase, if I have enough faith to move mountains, this phrase was actually a very common phrase in the Hebrew culture. Here's what to be a remover of mountains was. Listen carefully. This is something for you to Google in your free time. The phrase remover of mountains, it was a metaphor that was commonly used in Jewish literature. So if you were a masterful teacher or spiritual leader, they would call you a remover of mountains. In essence, what Paul is saying here is if I have all knowledge and all the, the mysteries and all prophecy and all the faith and I'm able to be the most incredible teacher so that you would call me a remover of mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. I hope that brings a little clarity to you because this concept of being a remover of mountains by your faith, it's not inviting you to see obstacles move out of your way as much as it is Paul using a phrase that was common to the first century believers. They would have heard this idea of a remover of mountains. I think it's beautiful. Now hyperbole. The, the common way of communicating in the Old Testament. It was everywhere. I'll bring this reminder to you. Hyperbole is an exaggerated statement or claim, not meant to be taken literally, but rather intended to make a point. Hyperbole was quite uh, often used. We use it, of course, today. If I asked you if you slept well last night, you might say something like, I slept like a rock. Well, rocks don't really sleep, but I understand your point. You slept great. You didn't move all night long. We say things like, I couldn't eat another bite. Cry me a river. It's a jungle out there. These are all hyperboles. I don't take literally that there are maybe some lions and tigers and bears in the parking lot. When you say it's a jungle, you just acknowledge that it's a little bit hectic out there. When Jesus taught, he taught in hyperbole. He would say things like, cut off your 
hand if it caused you to stumble, pluck out your eye, not because he wanted you to take him literally, but rather because it was important to note that the way that he taught was to bring you to attention to a very specific point. And so when Jesus would make a phrase like this in, in uh, Luke chapter 14, verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and hate his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, even his own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Is he being literal? Are you supposed to hate your family? Of course not. What Jesus is doing is pointing out that in the new covenant, you will not be saved by any other individual, not even yourself, but rather it's only through God that you were made his, his child. So friends, as we read our Bibles, let's be careful that we don't just read it trying to find a literal thing to do, but rather that we understand that hidden inside this scripture is the beautiful reminder that what God finished, he did it on purpose. He did it intentionally and he completed it perfectly. The new covenant is done. So my faith to be a remover of mountains, no. Paul was really simply telling us, I could be the greatest teacher in the world. And yet, so that you call me a remover of mountains and yet without love, it's really not accomplishing anything. May we always operate in the love of the new covenant. I pray that this week you would find yourself loving people organically, effortlessly, not because you're trying to fulfill a command of God, but because you are filled with the very heart of God himself. God bless you. I hope you have a great rest of your week. If you're in Birmingham, come find us this weekend at Church Unlimited. If not, you can find us online. God bless you. Have a great rest of your week. We'll see you soon.